Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, the panel discussion, really, Overcoming Barriers to Justice, Prosecuting Sexual Violence, Domestic Violence, Stalking, and Human Trafficking, Involving Survivors from American Indian and Alaska Native Communities. Today's panel is hosted by Equitas in partnership with Red Wind Consulting, Inc. and Tribal Law Policy Institute. I will be facilitating this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us from, with my longtime colleague and friend, Vicki Bonas. My name is Jennifer Long. I am the CEO of Equitas, and I'll be introducing myself and other panelists in a moment. I just want to provide some uh, initial technical instructions for the panel and some background on the hosting organizations. If you have questions during the panel, please enter it into the question and answer box. We will answer questions periodically through the webinar. And you're also welcome. In fact, I encourage people to reach out to us directly, especially these expert panelists, um, anytime following today's presentation. And you'll be provided with contact information um, and follow up at the end of the webinar. A little bit about Equitas. Our mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, we conduct trainings, and we offer 24-7 consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. And we are also the lead organization on several projects. I've put them here. Many of them have individual websites, so please let us know. Um, you can reach out to us at equitasresource.org and we can direct you to other. Uh, as I mentioned, we are co-hosting this today in partnership with Red Wind Consulting, Inc., and I always feel like I worry I do a disservice to our partners when I'm the introducer. So you may hear a little bit more about it when Vicki speaks. But Red Wind is a 501c3 nonprofit organization created in response to the increasing needs of tribal and native specific programs to develop indigenous responses to domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Unfor unfortunately, resources have been slow to reach Indian country and native women had been organizing for years. However, the levels of technical support available to tribes and native specific organizations continue to be limited. And Red Wind was developed to bring additional resources to ending violence against women work while enhancing the capacity of tribal and native specific programs. We're also co-hosting today with the Tribal Law Policy Institute. Uh, Tribal Law Policy Institute is a culturally specific nonprofit organization that strives to improve justice in Indian country and the well-being, cultural, and health of Native peoples. For over 25 years, the 100% Native American-operated organization has designed and delivered training, technical assistance programs, research, and education so that Native nations and tribal justice systems have access to cost-effective resources, which can be adapted to meet the individual needs of their communities. TLPI is a recognized OVWTA provider providing training and technical assistance for the intertribal working group focused on exercising special tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians committing nine covered crimes included in the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act 2022, which includes sex trafficking, and previously assisted this working group under VAWA 2013 in their special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction. Today's webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of the Office on Violence Against Women. Uh, as I said earlier, I will be facilitating today's panel along with Vicki Bonas. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Equitas, and I already described our mission. I began my career as an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia, where I was in the Family Violence and Sexual Assault Unit. I've also served as a child advocate, a domestic violence advocate, and I uh, teach a class prosecuting sexual violence at Georgetown University. Previously, I was the senior attorney and then director of the National Center for the Prosecution of Violence Against Women at the American Prosecutors Research Institute, which was an arm of NDAA. I am joined today by Vicki Bonas. 
uh, Dine Apache, a Mexican who's been working to end violence against women against American Indian Alaska Native women for 40 years. She has a depth of experience working closely with tribes in developing and implementing a range of responses to violence against Indigenous women. She's conducted numerous on-site visits, facilitated sessions, and training for tribes over the past 25 years. She has experienced working intertribally as well as within a tribal's local culture. She developed and is the executive director, as I said earlier, of Red Wind Consulting, Inc. And they have worked coordinating and providing tribal training and technical assistance for recipients of tribal governments program in the U.S. Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women as a tribal governments program comprehensive TA provider. They've worked with tribal college and university campuses developing holistic responses to sexual assault and responses for, to, for urban native programs. Redwin also operates the Hasea Advocate Program and Urban Native Program in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Ms. Ibanez formerly was the executive director and founder of American Indian Community Housing Organization, an urban native organization in Duluth, Minnesota, serving survivors of domestic and sexual violence. She also developed Redwin's National Tribal Advocate Center, providing 40-hour domestic abuse training institutes and 40-hour sexual assault training institutes. She developed the curriculum for each training and serves as lead uh, facilitator faculty. Vicki? Oh, I think you're muted. Thanks, Jen. I really appreciate the introduction and um, am so excited to be working with you. I also have the good fortune um, and privilege to be able to introduce Leslie Hagen um, and as someone that I admire her work and respect all of the work that she has done in Indian country over the years. Leslie Hagen serves as the Department of Justice Justice's first National Indian Country Training Coordinator. In this position, she is responsible for planning, developing, and coordinating training in a broad, broad range of matters relating to the administration of justice in Indian country. Previously, Leslie served as the Native American Issues Coordinator for the Executive Office for the United States Attorneys. In that capacity, she served the EOUSA's Principal Legal advisor on all matters pertaining to Native American issues, among other law enforcement program areas, um, provides management support to the United States Attorney's Office offices and coordinates and resolves legal issues. Hagen is also a li liaison and technical assistance provider to Justice Department components and the Attorney General's Advisory Committee on Native American issues. She served as an AUSA in the we Western District of Michigan, staff attorney with the Civil Legal Justice Project for the Michigan Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, a Violence Against Women training attorney for the Prosecuting Attorneys Associ Associate of Michigan. Leslie also served as the prosecuting attorney for Hur Huron County, Michigan for two terms, an assistant prosecuting attorney for Midland County, Michigan, and a pre-hearing division attorney for the Michigan Court of Appeals. Uh, I'd like to introduce Nicole Matthews. Nicole is a descendant of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe and is the executive director for the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, a statewide tribal coalition and national tribal technical assistance provider addressing sexual violence and sex trafficking against Native people. Nicole was one of five researchers who interviewed 105 Native women used in prostitution and trafficking for their report, Garden of Truth, the Prostitution and Trafficking of Native Women in Minnesota. Nicole has served on numerous boards, committees, and task forces. She is a TEDx speaker and a national and international speaker on sexual violence and sex trafficking and the intersections of racism and oppression. She also is an expert in the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women, which is something we'll be speaking about today. Nicole's most important role is being a mother, grandmother, sister, auntie, and matriarch. Jerry Muma, um, founder and executive director, a Shoshone Cree human trafficking survivor who had once been counted among missing or murdered indigenous persons. Jerry transformed her lived experience, her trauma, her rage, her pain into the positive vision that has become a national model for collective action in seeking justice and a better life for survivors of human trafficking. 
Initially operating from the trunk of her VW in 2016, Jerry grew Innovations HTC to become a leading force in providing safety and support for human trafficking survivors. Training first responders and frontline workers, advocating for policies to end trafficking and building a network among tribal, state, and local leaders committed to elevating and addressing trafficking and MMIP. In addition to our work at IHTC, Jerry has served as a consultant for the Department of Homeland Security Blue Campaign and has served as a subject matter expert on human trafficking with the Office on Violence, uh, Office on Victims of Crime and Office of, on Trafficking in Persons. Jer Jerry has, re has been recognized by the Department of Justice for her life's work on, imp on improving the lives of human trafficking survivors. With more than two decades of anti-trafficking experience, Jerry continues to serve vulnerable and high-risk youth and adults by providing trauma-informed advocacy, case management, response protocol development, program de development and oversight, and creating curricula, curriculum and training, content and commercial sex sexual exploitation, human trafficking, MMIP, and violence against people. I'd like to introduce Troy Morley, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and he is the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Liaison. Liaison for the Grape District, a world member of the Morley's outreach to the tribal communities has been pivot in strengthening the District of South Dakota's ties with tribal law enforcement officers, tribal courts, tribal social service agencies, and tribal decision makers. He has built bridges and promoted cooper cooperation among all levels of federal, state, and tribal law enforcement. Morley joined the U.S. Attorney's Office in Pierre, South Dakota in May of 2012, and for over five years, he prosecuted violent crimes occurring on the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota. In June 2017, he transitioned to similar work on the Crow Creek and Lower Brule Reservations. He became the district's tribal liaison in March 2015, and in that role has had a deep and holistic impact on tribal communities throughout South Dakota. He has helped form working groups with state governments, both North Dakota and South Dakota, to implement reentry plans for individuals returning to the community after incarceration. He has worked closely with tribal officials on, on pilot programs to exercise special domestic violence jurisdiction. He serves as a mentor in a special program he developed for the Pierre Indian Learning Center, regularly coaching students about how to succeed in life and how to avoid bullying behavior. He's been a key voice in discussion surrounding the selection of special assistant United States attorneys assigned to four of the state's nine reservations, Standing Rock, Sisseton, Wapiton, Flandreau, and Rosebud. His partnerships have also helped identify cases leading to successful federal prosecutions. For instance, Morley's work with a tribal special assistant U.S. attorney has identified repeat domestic abusers, leading to an appreciable uptick in the prosecution of habitual domestic violence offenders harming women and children in the district. Kelly Stoner serves as Tribal Law and Policy Institute's Victim Advocacy Legal Specialist. For over 20 years, Kelly taught at law schools in North Dakota and Oklahoma, teaching classes and directing clinical programs focused on American Indian, tribal law, and domestic violence related classes. Kelly has eight years of experience as a judge for the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma and frequently publishes on issues of violence against American Indian women and children. So today, this is going to be a very rich panel. I can tell people there is more information in here that can be covered in an hour and a half fully and comprehensively, but we will definitely talk about many issues. And again, I, I recommend that people reach out to the experts on this panel. As a result of today's panel, participants will be able to better improve practices and identify and eliminate bias that impact prosecutorial decision-making. Identify and work to eliminate biases, refine and develop practices and policies that enhance public trust and make sure the system works fairly for all and promote fairness through cultural humil humility, improve training and accountability through data-driven practices and create change in doing so.
This web-based panel is an opportunity to explore the ways in which bias against survivors from Alaska Native, Amer Native American, and tribal communities affects the investigation and prosecution of sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, and human trafficking in an effort to ensure that we remove barriers preventing survivors from tribal communities from accessing justice. We thought we would start off the panel with a brief definition of terms that we'll, we will use during this panel to ensure that participants understand how we are using the terms and what, what, uh, what do we mean when we say. Um, things such as um, bias, um, and when we think about bias, thinking about both implicit bias and explicit bias. So when we're talking about implicit bias, um, it is when one's decisions are unconsciously influenced by pre-existing beliefs about a certain group of people. Explicit bias is when one um, is aware of their pre-existing beliefs about a specific group of people and makes intentional decisions based on these beliefs. Types of implicit bias um, can include things such as race and ethnicity, age bias, gender bias, LGBTQ uh, bias, community bias, ability bias, and other types of bias. I also want to mention um, the terms victim and survivor. Um, they're, they're often used interchangeably and different um, groups of people working in the field um, will will lean toward one term um, more frequently than more frequently than in another. Um, the term victim is commonly used in the criminal justice work and to refer to a person that has been harmed by a crime. Um, and when we think about the term victim, oftentimes for those working in, on the programmatic side, we're often finding um, uh, people who have experienced harm uh, from a crime. Uh, preferring not to be called a victim. Um, it may have a negative connotation for them and it makes them feel like they are powerless or weak. Um, the term survivor has been used more frequently in, in the field of advocacy and some of the other programs that are responding to people that have been harmed by crimes. And using the term survivor um, helps people um, recognize that they have moved forward as a result of the impacts of the crime. Additionally, I just wanna mention um, when we talk about American Indian, um, Native American um, terms that oftentimes those terms can be used differently in different settings. And um, there's Native American, American Indian, Indigenous, First Nations, and they, tend, they can have um, uh, different context based on where people's are, people are working in, in the different aspects of the field of this work, as well as um, like if we're more North, we might hear more about First Nations as, we're, um, as we uh, work more in federal arenas, we may hear more about American Indian and Alaska Native. As we're more working programmatically, we might talk more about Native American. Um, most frequently what we wanna remember that um, we want to get more specific. Those are very broad terms. So we want to refer to a person's own indigenous identity and refer to the tribal identity that they, that they carry. So starting off with um, the first question, um, when we think about um, that the rates of violence um, from a National Institute of Justice report released in 2016, approximately one in two American Indians or Alaska Native women ex reported experiencing rape at 51, 56.1%, physical violence 55.5%, or stalking at 48.8% by an intimate partner. Is there a disparate impact of sexual violence and intimate partner violent on survivors from Alaska Native Indigenous tribal communities. Thank you, Vicki. Um, yes, I mean, I think if you, you know, the statistic that you just read off really, um, just when we look at those numbers and the, and where we are in the, if you look at census data, like how much we represent um, in this, um, 
in the overall population, you can see the huge disproportionate impact in our communities. And, um, and you can see how it leads to other things, right? So when we look at domestic violence, you can see the connection to um, women who are murdered by an intimate partner. So you look at the missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives, um, and many women who are murdered are murdered at the hands of someone that they know, um, oftentimes someone that they are in an intimate relationship with or a family member. Um, when we look at the impact of sexual violence, we will see, we see um, our relatives who have multiple victimizations in their lifetime. So maybe child um, sexual abuse and um, could also be, you know, exploited as they get older and used in prostitution and trafficking um, and may also experience domestic violence. So we see the, the huge impact that has on our families and um, and the ways that we continue to be to be harmed and the connection with our missing and murdered indigenous relatives. One study here in Minnesota showed that while Native women represented only one percent of the overall population, we um, represented over eight percent of the murdered women in Minnesota. And so you can see like the impact that it has in our communities and that violence. And so. Um, I, you know, definitely there is um, a disparate impact in our communities and, you know, all of us are here because we are trying to, um, to do something to change that um, for our future generations. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I think I'd only add to this from <clears throat> my perspective, one of the problems we see is the isolation many of these victims face. Um, they don't have the resources that are available in the larger cities. And I know many tribes are working on getting support groups there, but they are literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. They, they are living with the person who's abusing them. They probably have children. They may be staying in his parents' house. And a lot of times they are isolated and kept away from law enforcement in these remote settings. And they're not allowed to seek help. They're not allowed to try and get the offender help. And them and their children are taught from a very young age that you don't talk to the police. Um, and that, that sort of forces them to stay in these very unsafe conditions. So we're talking a little bit, I mean, and for people who are, you know, OVW grantees who know that for trafficking, we can address you know, sex trafficking, but also other trafficking where there's an intersection. And so I think sometimes people forget that there may be labor trafficking victims who are also experiencing one of the VAWA covered crimes. They may also be sex trafficked or experience sexual violence or stalking in the course of the recruiting or the um, obtaining um, the means for trafficking them. And so I wanted to pose this question uh, to Jerry. Are there increased vulnerabilities for individuals from American, Indian, Alaska, Native communities that lead to increased rates of human trafficking, both sex and labor trafficking? Um, thank you for that question. And, you know, as is not only a, a survivor of, of trafficking, which, which I consider myself a thriver, um, a running a direct client service organization that serves both labor and sex trafficking, what we have found on our screening intakes is the poly victimization and, you know, the stalking and, and um, not understanding what really a trafficking victim is, 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 is a barrier too. And so when we really look at it, we see a lot of times that there is such an overlap that we are, we are marking, you know, labor and sex trafficking. They're being forced to place ads for other, um, you know, victims um, online. So that is, you know, computer work um yard work there's you know taking care of the house there's so many things that they receive punishment for that are labor trafficking um 
that, you know, you hit that like right on the head when you said about the inter intersectionality about, um, you know, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and, and then, you know, stalking and then, um, really stalking is, is, is recruiting. It is, it is planned recruiting. And so, um, the intersectionality of that needs to include, um, you know, domestic violence, um, which is incredibly up in, in, um, I would say 99% would be intimate partner violence, including fi family violence. And um, it is all so intertwined. And then also, you know, that that sexual violence is used as, as a control mechanism as well. And so um, I that really resonates with me. So I guess... Give following up on that question, can you talk about some examples where victims were missed or misidentified based on this lack of understandings that were present, maybe unique to tribal land or to individuals from communities, from Alaska, American Indian, Alaska Native communities? Jerry, did you want to start? You know, um, I I would. Um, first thing, I really want to let you know, you know, I have been doing this work for um, over two decades. And even myself, I did not recognize myself as, as a victim. Um, I saw myself as, as, as 90, you know, 95% of our, our, our clients is, you know, this is my life. I, I got trapped into this and not having that, that agency to self identify really puts barriers for others to identify. And then you have to look at, you know, trauma bonding, protecting the perpetrator, um, all of the different dynamics that really go into that, um, it really makes identification hard. And another thing that I want to add is most people that are not doing direct human trafficking services are not screening for trafficking. And, and this is a huge problem. If, if you are not screening for stalking, you are not screening for, you know, trafficking, if you're, if you're not front loading the questions that are not, you know, providing shame, the timing of when you screen for that, do you have the follow-up support, you know, all of that really leads to such a barrier and then there's the apathy of, you know, especially within reservations, nothing's going to happen if you, you report and, and, and the fear of law enforcement. And so I have seen over the last um, decade, more and more relationships being um, uh, made with U.S. attorneys, um, other government offices that that we are able to get higher um, prosecution and identification of um, victims, but we have to look at the small percentage of Indigenous people that actually live on their reservation. Um, Sixty-seven percent of us, and that's low live off the reservation. And so, you know, when, when Troy was talking earlier, you know, about lack of access to services, we, we need to look at that too. And so screening um, is, is huge. Not even being asked if they're Native American is, is still a huge problem. And um, yeah, I want to hear from Nicole. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. You lifted up many really amazing things. And, and, you know, I, I want to get specific about um, who should really be thinking about screening, because I think when we're looking at particularly victims of um, sex or labor trafficking, there's a huge connection to um, being unhoused and to our um, homeless population. And so if you have a program that is working with victims of um, who are unhoused, I think you should most definitely be screening um, to see if there's that connection. And also, I wanted to also lift up, like, you know, we have um, 
you know, many, you know, 574 tribes, but we don't have 574 programs that are serving victims. And, and we have large, very, you know, several large urban Indian populations and don't have as many um, urban Indian programs to serve those communities. And so, and we know from listening to our relatives that um, Native victims most often want to go to a Native program where they are served by another Native person. So we also need um, more access to those, to Native programming so that we can feel like um, this person understands where I'm coming from. They may not understand everything I've been through, but they understand um, the connection to historical trauma and um, have some understanding of, of, of that. And I also think, you know, when we look at um, access and, you know, who is being missed, I think when we look at the issue of missing and murdered and the connections, you know, with sex and labor trafficking and, and for one of the stories that we heard a lot, um, you know, in doing some of the data gathering on missing and murdered is, once um, a person is uh, a body is found, they they're t they're um, looking doing a you know um, they're deciding for us what the racial or ethnic group is, and so we're not always classified in death data either, and so also looking at you know those connections. I also you know thinking about like our unhoused populations. And I'm sure that many people on this call are seeing many, um, you know, tent cities pop up across the country and many more of our unhoused relatives and the increase in um, exploitation that is happening in those places where it's really, you know, a, a, a beacon for perpetrators to go, hey, there's, you know, a vulnerable population right here um, that I can access. And so, you know, all the more reason to really be focusing some of our attention and some of the services in those communities. Um, and many of which for native populations, we see, you know, we are in those, um, in those unhoused tent cities, we're together, right? We oftentimes see communities um, where it's a large native population. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. And actually, that was very timely, Nicole, because we did have a co communication and the question and answer about unhoused um, populations and domestic violence. And I think you really covered that well here. Thank you, Nicole and Jerry. Um, so do these vulnerabilities contribute to the unjust arrests of human trafficking victims from American Indian and Alaska Native communities for prostitution related crimes? or other forced criminality directly related to or caused by their trafficking? And that's for Jerry or Nicole and Nicole. Nicole, do you wanna go ahead and take this one first? I mean, unless you are ready to go, yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to follow your lead. Um, you can take it first, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I do absolutely, and and I think one of the reasons that that victims don't report is because they are criminalized. Um, they are arrested, and oftentimes we see, you know, more um, victims being arrested than those who are buying and selling. And so the reality is is that um, they are arrested. And, you know, years ago when we were doing our Garden of Truth research, um, the reason we used prostitution and trafficking together is because oftentimes people think, well, the woman who's engaged in prostitution, um, she chose that. It's, you know, it's her fault. It's her choice. Um, and but we will feel sorry for the victims of sex trafficking, which at that time, many people only thought about it in terms of like um, people from other countries. Right. Like. Um, and it wasn't until maybe the last 10, 15 years that we really started looking at domestic trafficking and what was happening here. Um, and really, all the women that we talked to, the Native women that we talked to, um, that maybe didn't have a pimp or a trafficker, certainly weren't doing it because um, they were, you know, becoming millionaires and just um, found this very lucrative job 
right? They were doing it because they had a history of trauma and exploitation. They were doing it because they needed to buy formula for their children. They were doing it because they needed to find a place to stay. Um, and, and many of them were arrested and had, you know, multiple, um, arrests and convictions for, for a lot of things. And when that happens, that of course, um, also sets them up to not be able to access other things that we take for granted, such as um, housing, right? Because if you have a record, it's really hard to find um, safe housing, um, also to find a job. And um, so a lot of the things that we take for granted, those who have been used in exploitation and used in trafficking, find it very hard to access. So when we say, well, just get out, right? And just get a job. Um, that's very difficult when we have stacked up all these things against them. And so I think we really have to look at what those barriers are and to be providing more opportunities. And, you know, we have like the safe harbor laws that provide um, diversionary programs for youth. But what about our um, our adults, right? Just because someone turned from 17 to 18 doesn't mean they're any less of a victim and um, and harmed in exploitation. So I will say that much and turn it over to you, Jerry. Thank you so much um, for letting me follow up on that. You hit on so many really good points. You know, when, when we're really talking about, you know, how does bias really lead to like unjust criminalization of victims of trafficking? Um, being a survivor myself, um, I can tell you that, you know, there were several times when, in, and I was trafficking as a minor, where, um, an officer, you know, undercover or whatever would see me get pulled over or uh, get in a car, pull us over. I would be arrested as a 14 year old and this 20, you know, or 30 plus year old buyer would be tapped on the shoulder and go away. If there wasn't a change of money, that would be child rape. And, and, you know, the unjust of that and the criminalization absolutely has has fueled me to not only do direct client services which i'll talk a little bit more about but to do policy work because we have to have that upstream approach and the only way we are going to do that is by changing the laws and so we have a subgroup or a program of innovations where we are survivor you know bipoc led and we have been able to get several laws money dumped into the state we got 9.4 million dollars dumped into washington from our work in 2023 for healing support and transition services, which leads me exactly into what you're talking about, because we have so many clients that would, and there's studies that that 89.9% of the people say they would leave right now, today, this exact second, if they had other options. But we're talking about the options of the optionless the the people with no options and so many of them may not have a pimp but they are being exploited by an intimate partner they do not see it they they're there we we have so much exploitation that is going on within our camps uh you know um, being overran by gangs where they're charging rent. And if and an ind individual doesn't have the rent, then they are being trafficked. You know, we have to look at the whole intersectionality and, and also really look at it. This is a market driven enterprise. It is it globally. It's a $150.2 billion a year criminal enterprise, second to drug smuggling. It is a reusable commodity. If you sell the dope, you got to go and get more dope. With a person, you can sell them over and over again. So we are seeing more and more people turning from you know drug dealing, but still doing that, but turning to exploiting people. And as, as you know, the prices 
um, of everything. We're seeing so much survival sex individuals that that if they had a job, uh, if they had a way, you know, we can pay their rent for a couple of months. We can get them in a hotel. We can get them into a shelter. We can get them into an entrepreneurship program, but we're not able to pay their bills. Why are we not looking at what true exit looks like and coming together as a community and get those policies and laws and those grants out so we can collectively change this? And bias leads to arrest and it leads to Barriers, I'm happy to say we were successfully able to get a usable um, uh, uh, criminal, uh, oh my gosh, my brain is is not is not working, um, where, where charges can be pulled off of their record, uh, vacature, right. uh, vacature. Um, yep. mm -hmm. and that includes fringe um, crimes such as shoplifting, stealing condoms, and we worked very hard on that. So I, I'm sorry, I'm no, on just, a soapbox. You know, thank no. you so well, so much, and thank no, you for thank you, Nicole. No, and I didn't. I was. I didn't mean to jump in. I was thinking these are all. I mean, these are from a prosecution, and I know that this is much broader. Where we're talking about prosecution strategies, and these are. And we've talked about this before, Jerry. But for Nicole and what you had said, and Vicky before. These are important dynamics for us to understand as prosecutors. First of all, it helps us understand the facts in front of us and perhaps how someone has been recruited because we come from a place where we understand perpetrators are very purposeful. And so all of this information, and it answers the questions, not only in the courtroom, but sometimes the questions in the community, right, of the why don't they leave or why this or why that. And so I think that's dynamics, it's important as we're moving through, this is how it all threads together when we think about the violence. And I'm going to throw it back to you, Vicki. I know you're a facilitator, and I know a lot of what's been spoken about uh, necessarily answers a question about how bias and what it leads to could impact a victim's willingness or ability to report these crimes. But could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so when we think about that, that impact on victims and how bias plays out, one of the one of the pieces in there is around trust of the system itself. Trust that law enforcement will treat them with respect, will believe them, will follow up, will do good investigation. Um, trust that the prosecutor will hear them, will work with them in ways that are respectful. And um, and then mixing in there is that piece that was already talked about was that threat of being criminalized. Um, and so in the process of, if I say this, is this safe to say this? What's gonna happen if I, if I tell the full story? Um, so there's all of those things that are interconnected and then the other piece that plays out, it has to do with relationships and community, um, thinking about what happens when this information gets out in the community about me. Um, how am I going to be treated? And not only how am I going to be treated by people that care about me, um, but also what's the potential um, judgment and backlash that's going to happen as well. Are there is there going to be pushback and threats coming from the from the community? Some members that are uh, connected to the to the person who is doing harm that's going to um, try to harm me for speaking up. So there's so many different layers in there, and then there's just one other piece I want to mention that um, when we think about bias, there's also this piece about how the system itself is responding, how it's how it's coming forward. And for instance, I was working with a tribe out in California and one of their biggest problems is um, with this being a public law 280 state that law enforcement won't even respond. Um, so they have are building, trying to build a relationship to get law enforcement to come out and respond to the tribe. So you can't even get it toward prosecution uh, because you can't move it forward if you don't have a law enforcement response. Thank you so much, Vicki. And Kelly, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about legal barriers that are 
specific uh, to victims from tribal communities to accessing the criminal justice system? Thanks, Jennifer. Well, I have a few, but I want to start out. You mentioned earlier about the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization 2022 and how at least a portion of that led to amending the Indian Civil Rights Act. Why is that important? Because in 1978, the Supreme Court declared that tribes had no criminal authority over non-Indians committing crimes against Native women in Indian country. And that's important because the latest data we have demonstrates that approximately, I've seen higher, but approximately 86% of Native women who are victimized are done so the the perpetrator is a non-native so that basically strapped tribes so to me the number one legal barrier to accessing justice for native victims is a lack of respect for tribal sovereignty we should never need a federal law that declares that a tribe has this inherent authority to keep their citizens safe no matter what race the perpetrator is. So I wanna say that because I'm gonna come back to it in a bit to talk more about how that might impact investigations. So that's number one with me. Uh, number two is uh, victims coming out of Indian country. And this may hold true for, for victims coming out of rural places too, but it's more complex when we have a native victim there's no access to justice. There's no um, access in most instances to well-trained uh, attorneys to assist them, whether they're moving through civil or criminal. Um, attorneys who've been trained or have experience working with Native victims um, that understand what victim-centered prosecution is, uh, that understand um, about the mistrust that some natives will have when they are accessing state systems or even the federal systems. Those, that mistrust comes from historically shameful treatment of Native Americans. And so this isn't going to go about, away quickly. We need um, systems that demonstrate that they have an understanding or at least a respect of the customs, the traditions that this victim, the language barriers, this victim might be coming uh, to the attorney with trying to access the system, and also the biases that we'll talk about just a little bit later as well, that these outside, being outside of the tribal systems, the biases that are prevalent as this victim is trying to navigate sometimes multiple systems outside the tribal system. Thanks, Kelly. So what does this say about a larger systemic problem for victims from tribal communities? And that's back to you again, Kelly. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to continue on with my thread about respecting tribal sovereignty. And I'm just going to you know, ask a couple of questions of the audience here. They don't need to answer, but just to ponder on. I want you to, for a moment, think about a tribal victim um, who has been victimized and maybe who has reported this crime to tribal law enforcement. Um, I want you to think about another Supreme Court case that has come down recently, and I said this historical, shameful historical pattern of Castro Huerta, a case that's come down in the last couple of years that basically says states also have criminal jurisdiction over crimes committed by non-Indians against Indians um, in Indian country, and they're going to apply state law there. Think about how that tribal victim who has reported to tribal law enforcement now may find herself having to report to state all those things I just talked about, the mistrust, the lack of cultural sensitivity, the bias. She now has to tell the story again because the state decides they are going to prosecute as well. And theoretically, although I don't know that it's probable, but theoretically, 
the federal system can come in and prosecute the same thing. And the victim is telling this story over and over and over. And guess what, folks? If she misstates, maybe doesn't understand the exact question, and we end up with a variety of different responses to the same question, where does that leave her? Um, I want you to also think one more thing. Think about the danger, the safety impl implications, going back to respecting sovereignty. When we end up with a victim who has a tribal protection order, she crosses outside of Indian country, there's a violation of that order, that tribal protection order, and the state will recognize it. Think about the safety implications there and think about some of those same implications when we get states not even wanting to recognize tribal custody orders. This is setting up the perfect storm. And again, to me, it's all leading back to a lack of respect for tribal sovereignty. Thank you, Kelly. And just to follow up, you know, I think when in Indian country, we're having to deal with all of these different systems, right? State, federal, tribal. Also, there is a distrust in systems outside of our own. There's often, you know, sometimes we have distrust of our own systems, but looking at the relationship that our tribes also um, have with those other systems. And, you know, I'm I'm in Minnesota and we're a public law 280 state, but we have, you know, two tribes that are not public law 280. Um, and looking at the the relationships that some of our tribes have with with the state um, and local governments is not always great, right? And so, um, in fact, we've heard stories of, you know, victims that, you know, they would call 911 and nobody would respond because they're talking about whose jurisdiction it is. Um, and when you call for help, you want help, right? You want someone to be responsive to those calls for help. And, um, and so I also think, you know, in Indian country, word travels really fast. And so we know when they're not responsive. And then, um, and so then victims will stop calling. They'll stop reaching out. They'll stop looking for help. And they will get that message that these systems aren't going to work for me. Um, they're not going to respond. And so, you know, some people might think, well, well, there, we're seeing a decrease in numbers. It, it could be because people are... Um, having less trust in those systems that are there to support and respond. And, um, and ultimately what we really need is to have um, all of those systems who are working together to make sure that we have the best possible um, outcome and accountability with offenders and that we're making sure that victims are, are safe in our communities and in our homes. And thank, thank you to all of you. I mean, you've brought up so many, uh, I mean, everything is practical and some of the legal practical barriers. And I would just say to the participants on this webinar to remember, you have panelists on here whose whole focus and work, and you've got people from the AUS AUSAs all the way down to organizations who work to pull people together to collaborate, to try to close these gaps. So I invite all of you to please reach out afterwards if you're in a jurisdiction that is struggling um, with these issues. So I want to now, um, speaking of one of our uh, AUSA guests, ask Leslie if you could discuss experience overcoming some of the stereotypes we've heard about or perhaps others uh, against victims from American Indian Alaska Native communities, especially those involving alcohol when prosecuting alcohol-facilitated sexual assault cases. Thank you, Jen. I think we could spend the rest of the time talking about uh, alcohol and sexual assault. Uh, some of those myths and biases and misconceptions apply in non-Native cases, just as well as they do uh, cases involving Native Americans. I think many in the community lose sight, and by community, I mean our jurors, um, sometimes lose sight that more often than not, the assailant is someone known to the victim and trusted by the victim. I also think uh, many still fail to recognize that alcohol is the number one drug used to facilitate sexual assault. Alcohol is easily attainable. It's legal. Um, 
you know, we see that most defenses are consent. Um, when we have sexual assault where the victim um, and likely many times the defendant have both been using alcohol. I think what pe people fail to realize is that, you know, defendants are looking for a victim vulnerability. Troy mentioned the isolation for native victims. Use of alcohol is also um, something that leaves people vulnerable to sexual assault. So defendants are looking for those that are intoxicated. Um, I spend a lot of time teaching and teaching law enforcement and prosecutors that under federal law, uh, which is the last cases that I've prosecuted, um, it is a, uh, if somebody is convicted of 18 United States Code section uh, 2422, trial, correct me if I'm wrong, 2242, um, that that is punishable by life or any term of years. It's a very serious crime and that people can voluntarily drink a tremendous amount of alcohol, become intoxicated, but that intoxication does not equal consent. So this is a constant uphill battle because I see law enforcement that um, look at victims who were voluntarily intoxicated as perhaps less credible, and that those cases, um, you know, may not, again, in their um, poor judgment about it, may not merit the attention or the investigative work. Also, victims are reluctant to report because of the blame and shame that they feel if they voluntarily used alcohol. So these are universal feelings and biases that are seen in all communities. I think it's magnified when we have uh, someone from Indian country because there are additional myths and biases layered on top of the ones that we have for everybody when it comes to Indians and alcohol. Um, and that unfortunately, it still exists today. Uh, I saw it picking juries. Uh, you know, I had the benefit of being where I could ask a lot of questions during jury selection um, to try to explore some of those biases, but they are there. And for prosecutors that are doing sex crimes, I think to continue to work with the public to educate them, again, they're gonna be your jurors, um, about the truth around alcohol and sexual assault, um, educating judges, um, continuing to train prosecutors and law enforcement that are looking at these cases and working with your counterparts on the reservation are incredibly important. There is still a lot of work to be done in this area. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, can you discuss your experience overcoming these stereotypes when pr prosecuting intimate partner violence or stalking? And I'm thinking you're talking to me. Yes. Uh, I just want to reaffirm and put, highlight bold italics, all the things that Leslie just said. I mean, that's pretty much all the points that I had on my list. I will add just a couple, just example. Um, and also, Jennifer, to do a shout out for Equitas and the... Uh, the research and the tools that you have for overcoming some of these stereotypes. They may not be tribal specific, but certainly I'm thinking prosecutors, you know, could get a lot of good information there. I want to just say a word about um, the intersection between, and we've been talking about this all the way through here, human trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, the intersection, I like that graph you had up earlier. It, it really, um, we need more education and we need it to be required uh, in state systems for sure, because no one will do it if it's not, about these intersectional pieces. Because victims, and we've heard this all the way through the webinar too, may present counterintuitive to what a judge thinks a real victim might look like. And that could be because of culture. It could be because of mistrust. And if we cannot get judicial and potentially even prosecutors trained to recognize that and begin to work around that, um, we're not gonna go very far um, 
in a positive way. So I think education, again, on implicit bias, bias um, explicit bias, and I really don't know how we're going to do this, but we really need a no tolerance for uh, judicial decisions that display those kinds of biases. And I don't know whether that would be training to address that or whether that would be um, peer review, uh, peer uh, sort of sanctioning. I'm just not sure. But it is just amazing to me as a former prosecutor and, and a tribal judge trying to deal with jurisdictions outside of Indian country, how much distrust they, it, they there is of tribal courts and how the treatment is like you you are someone inferior to me. Doesn't matter if you went to the same law school. Doesn't matter if you took the same bar, if you work for the tribe. So we really have to clear, we have to hold people accountable for that kind of behavior when we're talking about these stereotypes. You know, I think um, I may have a simple approach. I don't know. Um, I just don't pay attention to them. Uh, I, in, in the terms of sexual assault, I, I'll have officers or agents bring me cases and they'll say, well, you know, both people were drinking and he says he was just as drunk as she was. And I'm like, well, he remembers that he's yeah. lied to you. Um, let's look at the actions he's taken and let's go from there. Um, but what it, in the intimate partner, I mean, I think the biggest stereotype we're always facing is I would say nine times out of 10, they get back together with the person who was offended against them. And most people just can't understand that part. Um, how did I get past that when I was prosecuting a lot of these cases? I made sure to, first, I made sure to develop a relationship with the victims. I mean, I, I would drive six hours to go have a 20 minute meeting with them, uh, just check in with them, see how they're doing. And make sure they understood that, you know, I'm not there to tear their life apart, but I am there to make sure that they are safe. Because while you may be okay this time, it's the next time I'm worried about. And the other thing I would do is I would bring them to grand jury. Because I think one of the biggest misconceptions or biggest beliefs that offenders have um, is that, oh, she'll never testify against me. I'm going to fight this all the way. And then I could put that grand jury testimony right in front of the defendant and say, no, actually, she already has. And they signed the plea agreement right after that. And it's a much more calm, less intimidating setting for the victims. You know, yeah, there's, you know, 23 strangers in there with the grand jury, but it's just me asking them questions. And I already have that relationship with them. They don't have to look at the defendant while they're giving that testimony about it and telling the members of the grand jury what happened. They're not being cross-examined. Plus, you get to have a conversation with them about the outcome of the case at that point in time. And they 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 feel like they're being consulted. And really, they are. And they are getting input on how it goes. A lot of times, um, I know what a plea agreement is going to look like by the time I'm done with grand jury, just because of the interactions I've had with the victims at that point in time already. And then the other thing I do is if we do have to go to court, and I've done this in a couple of cases, is I will bring in experts to talk about the power and control wheels and how people who engage in this type of um, conduct manipulate their victims. And I, I mean, so many things you just brought up and for people again, and there are, I am watching the chats a little bit. If you see a wayward cursor, it's me because I want to see what people are saying, making sure we're responding and a lot of experience, obviously, um, of the participants in the group, but to remember these points, I mean, Troy, you said something drive six hours to have a conversation. I think people forgetting the vast, the, you know, the, how, what is the practical impact of having either having insufficient resources perhaps to to address victims is that you have remote response and that impacts the ability of the system to access the victim and a victim and perpetrator's belief that that um, victim can get assistance. So thank you for making that point. So the next question, do victims from American Indian Alaska Native communities with casinos present in the community face 
unique bias or present in the community faced unique bias in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking or human trafficking prosecutions. And there's a follow up there. Sorry, it was a little. And is it is it this is my fault? I think I I designed this a little tricky. <laughs> Your follow up question, Vicky. Okay. <laughs> to them. <laughs> Uh, does the bias exist against victims from tribal communities which do not have casinos present on tribal land? Sorry about that. Uh, Edit. Back to you, Troy. I I mean, I think this goes to an overall point I sometimes make when we talk about Indian country. We sort of assume that there's this one size fits all. And it's absolutely not the case here in South Dakota. Um, I can tell you, you know, th there's a couple reservations that do not have casinos. There's some that do. And I think they all face the same challenges. They all sit, face the same problems. They is there. I don't think casinos make much of a difference one way or the other, at least as I see it here in South Dakota. Um, now, as far as the human trafficking, one of the things I brought up, and I brought this up um, with Jeannie Hovland before, one of the trainings we need to start doing is with tribal security officers, um, surveillance, you know, the people who are watching casino floors, and the people who are watching the surveillance in the hotel rooms, what, and although it's not human trafficking, one of the largest drug busts that happened on Standing Rock when I was covering up there was from surveillance because they noticed suspicious activity going in and out of rooms or behavior on the casino floors. And I think the same thing would hold true for human trafficking. So biases, um, I'm not so sure, at least not in my experience. Thank you, Troy. I think some of the biases I see, I see like across the board, right? Because people think, especially if you have a casino, people think then that everybody is receiving these really hefty per caps and they're very wealthy. So they probably don't need, um, you know, any assistance. And so, but I think people think that about Native people in general. Um, so they think, well, you're probably getting all this money, right? And um, when I was doing advocacy, I would hear systems people say, well, why do I need to, to help them? Why can't she just go back to the reservation and get help? Um, and maybe she wasn't even from that reservation, right? But there's that like the ignorance about about them that then puts up barriers to them accessing services at all. And I think also um, one of the things that I've seen for, um, for tribes that do have casinos is... Um, you know, I don't know necessarily, this doesn't necessarily speak to bias, but one of the things it does do is it provides more access to victims. And so we see more, you know, an increase in traffic to the community that will um, then be an increase in accessing those that will be used in exploitation um, or trafficking or those, um, you know, victims are of sexual assault, MMIW, and so I do see when we have enterprises um, in a tribal community, it increases access to, to victims. Jerry? I just love following um, such incredible people. Um, one, one of the things that, that what, what I have seen is here in Washington state, we have um, 29 tribes and I think only four do not have casinos. So there's also that stereotype of, you know, why do you need services? Because, you know, your tribe's rich, you're going to get a big per cap. Um, but what I do want to talk about and, and what has been um, one of my you know, life's missions is what, what I have seen from casinos is, um, 
sorry, my computer's about to die. This is embarrassing. I need to plug this in. Um, what I have seen in our local casinos after training, um, you know, security officers and, you know, the slot attendants and pretty much, um, you know, working with with the the leadership and and also um, tribal gaming um, association, TGA, the, the eye in the sky, what we need to do is we need to continue to educate and have a set in stone response protocol. Um, we have worked with several tribes in the area. One would be the Nisqually tribe. We have a lot of learning lessons. We put stickers in the bathroom and trained all the security, had everybody, the protocol, the room, what, what you know, law enforcement, everything's going to look like. We put stickers in the bathroom and, and people would call and we'd say, where are you? And we didn't put numbers on it. And so we had like a lot of learning lessons, but what, what really we have seen in the casinos um, here in the Pacific Northwest is not native victims from that area. We are seeing many non-native victims being trafficked within our casinos and without a protocol um, I mean, I I was on the Aqua Sesame um, in, in New York and, and helping them with a the protocol. And most other ones are just to 86 or kick out the victim. And, and then they're replaced with somebody else. And so casinos um, need to be educated. You know, t the tribal gaming enterprise, everybody does because casinos are hot spots for native individuals from other tribes and and also for non-natives. And we also need to look at the the RV um, parking policies. We have seen a lot of mobile brothels um, and connecting that the 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 stay to their to their gaming card and you know doing more checks on that. I mean, we need to have a response because if we're not seeing it, there, there, there is, there is an issue because it is happening. And, and I can tell you that because we have many survivors coming forward that were exploited within the casinos. So thank you so, so much. Oh, you're muted, Vicki. For people, I just skipped over a question that Troy and Leslie had answered in their last response. Can you explain the impact of a protection order issued by a tribal court not being given full faith and credit by state and local courts and strategies prosecutors can use to counter this? Leslie? Okay, thank you. I, again, I think this is a training issue. I hear this issue again and again uh, as I travel around the country. Uh, so for those of you that may not know exactly what full faith and credit is in terms of tribal orders, uh, if somebody gets a protection order from a tribal court, uh, let's say it's the Sault Ste. Marie tribe in northern Michigan, and they travel down to Detroit, and there's a violation of the personal protection order in Detroit, then Detroit police should enforce that protection order as if it was one issued by a court in Detroit. So that means that that protection order should be good everywhere. So very simply, if they're not being recognized and given full faith and credit, um, victims are not safe. Offenders are getting away with behavior that has already been reviewed by a court, um, and they've had certain parameters put um, and restrictions put on them. One thing that I have always said, and I, I think sometimes there's too much of a focus on the order and, you know, is it entitled to enforcement, et cetera? Yes, it is. But the other thing that I think officers need to look at, responding officers, is that I think probably 99% of the time, 
whatever is constituting the violation of the protection order is also a separate crime that should be investigated and prosecuted um, in the jurisdiction where that crime is committed. Troy? Yeah, um, you know, I think Leslie hit the point on the head, but or the nail on the head, but, um, you know, one other point I think that's important is many of the tribes now have TAP terminals, the tribal access program. And a lot of these questions about getting it registered, getting it enforced, if the, if they would work through those terminals and get those protection orders entered into NCIC, which many tribes have the ability to do now, it's going to eliminate the problem on the front end. Um, you know, the back end, they can go fight in court and hopefully they've gone to Leslie's training and someone's going to understand that there is a federal law that covers this. But just for that immediate safety, that immediate response, we need to also start working with the tribes to make sure they're fully using the TAP terminals they have um, to benefit the victims as much as possible. Thank you. I don't really have anything to add except that, you know, it's really a safety issue. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that victims are safe. Um, and although, you know, protection orders are only a piece of paper, they're a really vital piece of paper that talks about their safety, their children's safety. Um, and, and, you know, how a court has already upheld, like these are the parameters that need to be in place to ensure that safety. And I think, um, you know, it goes back to sovereignty and sovereignty of our tribes to be able to issue these orders and ensure that they are being followed no matter what jurisdiction that victim travels to. So. And th uh, thank you to everyone. Troy, this is another question for you. If you could discuss the impact of um, not being able to access tribal records, tribal court records, if they're not submitted to NCIC and what impact that has on federal and state prosecutors in these crimes? You know, I can't speak to state prosecutors. Um, for me, it's not an issue. I can get the, through my tribal investigators, I can get tribal court records um, fairly easily. You know, I, I think, and this goes back to the TAP terminals again, or the tribal access program, and it's TAP, tribal access program, because I saw the question pop up on the bottom there. Um, I mentioned to tr many tribes when I'm working with them that this this is also a mechanism for them to put the domestic violence convictions in there, the domestic violence protection orders, those sorts of crimes which would preclude someone from being able to purchase a firearm um, just through a simple check. And if they're not putting that in there, just because the person may have been able to go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, buy a handgun because their tribal court conviction wasn't entered into NCIC and it didn't flag on the background check, that doesn't mean I'm not going to prosecute them if I find out they have a gun and I know they have that disqualifying conviction. So um, I guess the short answer is I don't get impacted that much by not being able to access um, tribal court records, but I don't know, I can't see if Leslie's slated to answer in this one as well, but I'll sort of tap her in on a tag team because I know she was a state prosecutor in Michigan for a while as well. Correct, Leslie? I was, yes. Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of not, um, and I'm just going to kind of segue into the next question, Jen, about what do we do if we don't have access uh, to those records? You know, Troy's exactly right. It may make it difficult to prosecute a violation of the Gun Control Act. We may not realize the person is a prohibited possessor. Um, also, uh, when prosecutors, let's say we do convict somebody in federal court, the U.S. Uh, Sentencing Commission has these guidelines, and we look at convictions um, to get a guideline range to score a particular defendant. Tribal court, um, tribal convictions are not 
counted as scorable offenses. So I think probably the sterling example of, of how that plays is many of you are probably familiar with the case of United States versus Michael Bryant Jr. It went to the Supreme Court in 2016, and it was a habitual domestic violence case. Well, he had been prosecuted and convicted more than 100 times in the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Court in um, Montana, uh, but those convictions wouldn't appear on an NCIC record. And, um, you know, until somebody forwarded that information to the feds, it's conceivable but that neither the FBI nor the U.S. Attorney's Office would have been aware of those convictions. So if we don't know that somebody has a misdemeanor conviction for domestic violence, if that has not been abstracted to NCIC, it may make it difficult for us to argue bond, uh, sentencing, you know, looking for appropriate charges like habitual domestic violence. If we are aware of those tribal court uh, convictions, we may need to physically go to the tribe to look at files. Um, we can then um, bring a motion for underrepresented criminal history. And I did that in a homicide case I tried where the defendant had been convicted a number of times in tribal court, but uh, again, none of that was scorable uh, in the federal court. So I made a motion and the defendant, uh, his sentence went uh, increased, almost doubled, uh, because then the federal court had um, a full understanding of what this person's criminal history was. And so thank you for that. And Kelly, flipping it around, if you could discuss a historical or current barriers to accessing from tribal prosecutors into federal or state databases that store criminal history. Well, I was a, a tribal prosecutor for about eight years for a tribe up in North Dakota, and I can tell you I had zero access. This was several years ago. I'll give that to you. But I just want to kind of raise this notion uh, while TAP has been very, very helpful to some tribes, there are still many tribes that cannot access or input data into TAP, and they are forced to sort of rely on the state. And in some places that works, but in some places it doesn't work. And so again, tribes being treated differently um, about being able to access very crucial data and and why that's super important i can tell you from my perspective i and there were violent uh uh domestic violence cases that were prosecuted i can tell you that i had no idea in some instances of what the criminal history was for this perpetrator i only know what i have in front of me i would get online i would try to search the the free state databases to see if I could find anything. There wouldn't be anything on other tribes. So that presents a huge safety issue for court personnel, uh, for law enforcement that are trying to investigate if they can't look things up. And as far as getting uh, protection orders to me, near and dear to my heart, getting protection orders entered into a database where someone can see that there is a protection order in place. Um, again, we are we are not doing 100% here. I am still working with tribes who are desperately trying to get their protection orders loaded into the federal system. They don't have TAP. They're trying to work with the state. The state may say, well, you need to use our form or you need to have this or that. Um, or you can't do it. It's still, it goes back to that issue of tribal sovereignty. Tribes should have access. We shouldn't today still be asking for it. Everyone should have it. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Um, this question's for Troy. Can you discuss your experience trying cases in federal court with typically few or no jurors from American Indian or Alaska Native communities on the panel. You know, again, I th I I feel like we're just fortunate here in South Dakota. No, this was a problem early on. 
Um, and it, it was difficult. I feel there were many situations where the evidence was very clear cut. And, you know, this is coming from a prosecutor, right? Um, I thought I did an amazing job. And it was very clear that this person was guilty. But th in these situations, it was most often um, like an assault with a dangerous situation type case. Everybody was drinking. And to me, it felt like those stereotypes and biases we were talking about in the past of, oh, this was just a couple drunken Indians, uh, whatever, everybody's okay. And there would be no conviction. Um, and, and those floored me at first until I found out that it was sort of a common problem. But recently, at our district court, they got some sort of challenge and they reached an agreement amongst themselves. And they're like double or triple entering um, the voter rolls from the reservations into our jury pool. So we're getting great representation on there. But, you know, I think for me, the biggest challenge, like I discussed early on, it also led me to understand that there's situations as a tribal member that I just considered normal that maybe shocked some of the other jurors. So I had to make sure I was slowing down and explaining the relevance of things that seem normal to me. Um, and that, that did help. Thank you, Troy. Um, so the next question, how does this exacerbate the tragedy of murdered and missing indigenous women? This question's for you, Leslie. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong person. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Nicole, please. I think it was both, but um, I mean, I think, you know, if we're looking at understaffing of law enforcement and um, and some of these challenges that our systems have, certainly if we don't have um, adequate responses to address missing and murdered, we're going to have gaps um, and we're going to have, um, you know, um, people are not going to get the timely responses that they're expecting. I mean, we see, even if you look at tribal law enforcement um, and the the small numbers of law enforcement and maybe the large service area that they're covering, it may take um, a long time to get to um, to get to the to get to the victim to be able to respond. And so, you know, I think many of these only exacerbate the issues of missing and murdered. And also, we have to work uh, more, you know. Um, collaboratively with our state and federal partners um, because oftentimes these cases are not only on tribal lands or might start on tribal lands and go off tribal lands um, or maybe start off tribal lands and go on to tribal lands. So I think we need to look at um, those cross-jurisdictional partnerships as well so that we can have, you know, um, adequate responses for victims and their families. Troy, anything else on all the issues that have been talked about today, how this may or may not exacerbate the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous people? I, you know, I think, I don't know that it's going to exacerbate it. I do think that it is helping to shine a light on some of the issues that maybe we didn't recognize that were already there. Um, you know, one of the big things I'll tell people when we have discussions is in my role as a federal prosecutor, I'm doing what I can to help on the front end. And those are with guidelines and responses. And, you know, those are through Savannah's Act um, and the Not Invisible Act. We're working with the tribes on those. But that situation is so fluid. And the BIA recently, well, not recently, it's been a few years now, reclassified juvenile runaways as missing and that was right they are missing um but you can imagine what that has done to the numbers um i mean while we have had this conversation i guarantee you any list you had is already outdated it, there, it's already changed 
Um, I'm focusing more on the murdered aspect as far as what I can do as a federal prosecutor. Um, I have had a little success. We, we've resolved a 30-year-old murder with the prosecution recently. I'm working with North Dakota. Um, I've indicted a sex trafficker up there. I'm working on a 10-year-old murder I hope to indict soon. Um, again, up in North Dakota. I've got another one down here in South Dakota that I believe we're close on. So I think the grassroots um, organizations have done a wonderful job of getting the message out and really organizing any efforts there are. And I'm just, I'm just trying to do my part to chip in where I can. Um, I know some couple of the tribes are now working on the tribal community response plans. Um, and we're hoping to get those sort of standardized and have some organization on the front end. So. Okay. And as, as I warned in the beginning, there was a lot, <laughs> there is, um, there's so much, uh, to this, but I would hope I wanted to end maybe to ask each of our amazing panelists what two steps a prosecutor's office could take that could improve, close the gaps, and that could enhance public trust in the system so that it worked fairly for, um, for survivors from these communities. And I'll start with you, Kelly. Okay, I wanna just say, um, I wanted to do this. 2015, I was at a implementing VAWA 2013 conference and Attorney General Loretta Lynch was there and she said something super profound. I don't know that I have two steps. You all might have to come up with the steps. But she said, we have a chasm in our justice system. She said, take a look at what we prosecute. Then you will know what we value in our society. And think about all the things we have talk, talked about here today. I think we need to access to justice for everyone. And I think we need to address the lack of respect for tribal sovereignty. Those would be my two. Leslie. Well, I'm always gonna say training since that's what I'm all about. And the other thing I think is um, we need to be courageous in our own offices and call out people when they're not doing their job, when they, you know, crack a joke. You know, if I hear one more person say, well, they went off the reservation. Now, I know they didn't mean anything when they said it, but just pulling that person aside and saying, you know, that that's derogatory. I know you didn't mean it that way, but but it is. So I think being courageous and calling people out that we work with will um, go a long way to helping the system. Jerry? I am um, all about collaboration. I, I think that individually we, we know um, a lot, but collectively we know a lot more. And so I really believe that some of the things that, that have been spoken about today that um, I would love to see, you know, some notes that were taken. I know that we need screening. We need um, training. I'm exactly with Leslie. Um, and we also need to continue to educate about how important it is to have indigenous led and survivor led voices included in conversations like this and um i am just i've i've put a lot of things in the chat and i i just believe that we all need to come together and you know look at our collectively work work so we're not recreating the wheel and um protect tribal sovereignty because, because it isn't. And, um, I would also like to say, you know, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of reparation and trust rebuilding that needs to be done, but I think that we are going in the right steps. So thank you very much. Nicole. I would say um, relationship building. I think relationship building is really key. 
um, not only when there's a case, but um, really building a relationship with that community um, because that will increase trust and then um, also follow through, um, which I think is really key because if you don't follow through, then we will know and the, the people will know and the victims will know that they can't count on, on you. So relationship building and follow through. And Troy. I think you have to be able to have the hard conversations as well. If, if things are being done wrong, I, I agree with Leslie, not only though in your office, but down with the tribal council, down with your tribal prosecutors or the tribal court, or with members of the community. I've spent the last four weekends going to powwows on Pine Ridge, Crow Creek, Lower Brule. Next week, I'm going to be in Rosebud. I'm not doing it because my job requires me to. People have asked me like, oh, do you get extra time because you're spending your weekends doing that? And it's like, no, I, I want to go down there. These are the communities I'm serving. And plus, they're my people. I mean, you, you have to be able to walk through the community with your head held high. And you might have those uncomfortable interactions. But I'll tell you what, more times than not, I've seen people I've seen in court and they wave to me, they talk to me, they ask me how I'm doing. They say, what are you doing down here? And I'm like, well, I wanted a piece of fry bread, you know? Uh, and and so you, you got to have those hard communities, but you also have to be involved. You, you have to care. You can't teach heart. You can't give heart to people in your office. And hopefully you're just surrounding yourself with people who share those same beliefs. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. I mean, can't imagine more going forward. Uh, very inspirational words. Very, again, accomplished expert individuals. Um, we will give you their contact information um, if it's available of how to reach them. And of course, you can always reach out to us at Equitas and we can put you in touch with people. Please um, take what you learned today and make one change in your offices. And thank you so much for all that you do.